Hey everybody, Leah Klett here with the Christian Post and my guest today is Ginger Duggar Vualo. You might know her from 19 Kids and Counting or the spinoff show Counting On. And now she's an author and we're talking about her brand new book, Becoming Free Indeed, My Story of Disentangling Faith from Fear. This is honestly, this was one of the most interesting reads um, I've read in a long time. I find your story so fascinating and you are so gracious about mm -hmm. the culture that you were raised in, but you very, you very clearly have been able to disentangle a lot of the problematic teachings from the truth of the gospel. So let's just jump right in and tell me why you decided to write this book. Yeah, that first, that thought first came to my mind more like in 2017, Jeremy and I had visited a conference that Bill Gothard had started several years before. And while we were there, I remember seeing so many of, of my friends who were still in that teaching, still in the IBLP world, as well as many who had, I'd hear stories about people who had like left the faith entirely because they were so confused about who Jesus was. And they were really sold a false view of God in the Bible. And so that really got me thinking, I want to say something eventually, but at that point I wasn't ready. I definitely was not ready to speak or, um, to say much on it. Cause I was still working through a lot myself. Mm -hmm. What was it like emotionally writing this book? Because you are very candid in it. Um, you talk pretty honestly about your own struggles with doubt and shame and having this performance-based religion. What was this journey like for you? Um, it was definitely the most difficult thing I've ever done um, for many reasons. I know um, the community I was raised in is so tight-knit. And I had a lot of fear surrounding that, that it may not be accepted or I may lose friends over it. And um, so that was probably one of the things that kept me from writing it for so long was just being ready to emotionally like go through all of this. And also part of writing a book on something like this is it takes a lot of research. And so I wanted to go back and listen to um, hours of lectures from Bill Gothard and hopefully pull out the things that um, had impacted me the most. And so that just takes time. And so, um, it, and it's also very difficult because you're walking back through um, all of that and working through it again. And so, but the the positive side of that I was really grateful because whenever I was walking through the teachings again, um, there were things I didn't even realize. Oh goodness. Like I, I didn't realize that's why, you know, we had the certain bread mixer or whatever it may have been that, you know, was said it will, it will help your life or you'll have health if you do this or that. And so I started to realize, oh, it, it really affected every single area of my life. And I knew it did, but, um, it, it did so even deeper, like seeing that, like in the teachings. Mm. Well, and before we really get into that, cause I'm so interested in, in Gothard's teachings and how they did impact your life. Why was it so important for you to, at the beginning of your book, really clarify, I'm not deconstructing my faith. I'm disentangling my faith because we're seeing such a trend right now. Um, I know you mentioned Josh Harris in your book. Um, we're seeing a lot of this deconstruction. Why is that not what you're doing? And why was it important for you to clarify that? I wanted to clarify on the front end because I know people will have very strong opinions about, um, what you should do. And I wanted to, as a Christian to share that I am not deconstructing. I am deconstructing is pulling apart everything, tearing it all down to the studs never to build it up again. And, and that's just not what I'm doing. And that's not my story. And I, I, and also I realized people who have gone that route, a lot of them have been so harmed by theology and people who claim to speak for God, but don't. And that's, that's where they end up because that's what the world tells them to do. That's what they say. The only answer is if you've been harmed by it, they can applaud people who have been in um, churches where they haven't experienced that and said, oh, hold to your faith. That's fine. It's your faith. But whenever you've walked through something like I have, and I know many others have, even if it's outside of Gothard circles 
in um, a religion that's based on man-made traditions, they say you have to throw it all out. And so I wanted to share my story because mine has been one of disentangling, which is pulling apart. It's a slow process, pulling out the air and examining everything according to the word of God. It's much harder to do, I'm sure, than deconstructing because people who deconstruct, they just throw it all out. They're like, I'm done. I'm yeah. going to live my life how I want to. But that's not true freedom. True freedom is not found in throwing off all restraints, all rules. It is found in knowing a person, Jesus Christ, and coming to the word of God and speaking. So speaking when scripture speaks and being silent when scripture is silent is something that I found was so helpful in this journey, like, because I didn't think that was possible before, right? Like I, in the teachings I grew up in, it was very, everything's black and white. And it's, um, if you live your life a certain way, you'll be blessed by God. Mm -hmm. Um, Gothard himself even said at times, he would say, um, in one of his seminars, I remember him saying life is a very delicate cause and effect sequence. So mm -hmm. if you live by my principles, which are, he would say were based, biblical principles. If you live by these seven basic principles, your life will be a success and God will make you prosper in everything that you do. And if you don't, your life will be one disaster after another. Mm -hmm. So that's how I live my life. I thought that's how God operated was based on um, these principles. And once I realized that's not the case, it really brought so much freedom. Um, but that first step of like realizing, oh, this is not true. It, it's scary because mm -hmm. you're told not to question it. You're told not to think for yourself. You're told what to think. And so once you stop and say, is this really what the word of God says? And you realize it's not, it feels like your whole foundation is shaken mm -hmm. and that can feel terrifying, but then realizing as a believer, as somebody who really wants what God, I want to glorify God and know what God thinks, know what pleases him. I'm going to go back to the word of God for my answers. Mm -hmm. Even if that takes me years of working through what I've been taught and saying, okay, well, I remember what this verse said, according to this teacher, what does it actually say? What was the actual context? What is the theme of the word of God? And what does this look like in my life? How should I live my life accordingly? That's, that's the process that I've been on for the past six years. And that's really why I wanted to share my story. Yeah, that's incredible. You know, when reading your book and kind of reading through Bill Gothard's beliefs, these ideas are so problematic, but you even talk about in your book, how so many people adhere to these teachings. What do you think accounted for his popularity? And why did so many really intelligent people who do love the Lord fall for this? Yeah, I think it really, it, it starts back with parents wanting to give their kids the best life possible and to have them avoid hardship and pain. And I think where Bill Gothard started was back in the sixties and seventies. Um, the sexual revolution was happening, sex, drugs, rock and roll. Parents wanted their kids to stray away from that and go towards Christianity. They wanted a guarantee for success. They wanted something simple. Give me the rules. I want to know what will make my kids love Jesus. So I think parents coming into it, um, and like you said, very intelligent people getting on board with this teaching, um, Bill Gothard started to fill up stadiums, bring people in from all over. And, um, but the sad part was, this guarantee for success, like I said, it's the cause and effect sequence. So if you do this, God's going to bless you. If you don't, he won't. Um, it seems so appealing. Like it appeals to us because we always want to have, like, even in parenting now, you know, it's like, I look at my kids and I'm like, I want to have an answer for you for everything. Mm -hmm. And I want your life to, I want you to avoid hardship and pain, but kids also like, will they will find, um, sin anywhere. And so if you shelter your kids from everything, and you try to give them only the best life. It's like, you can do your best as a parent, but at the end of the day, you have to trust God. And I think that, um, lack of, lack of trust in God, lack of trust in his words saying enough. I think that's where a lot of parents got tied up in it and wanted the best for their kids. And ultimately it, it ends up bringing harm because mm. that type of man-made religion can build up your kids to perform well. And they can have the fear that grips them and cripples them into obedience 
because you think if I step outside of this box, if I listen to rock music, I might be killed in a car accident. Yeah. Okay. That's scary. So you're, you're motivated by fear, not out of a love for God. So showing kids, okay, there is, you know, this is a consequence of sin, but what is sin? Is it, is it a man's opinion on what girls should wear? Um, what things you should avoid, what places you shouldn't go to, what you should eat, what you shouldn't eat. Um, it's not going to cause your kids to love Jesus. It's going to cause them to be fearful and worried as in viewing God as a terror waiting to smite you instead of viewing him as a loving heavenly father who forgives us for our sin, who, who is there with open arms to um, show us our sin, but then also provide the grace and ability to walk in a way that's pleasing to him because of our love for him. Yeah, exactly. The motivation is different when we're, when we're motivated by fear, that's where all the shame comes in um, versus we're modest because we want to honor God with our bodies. We want to glorify him versus I just don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to go to hell because I'm wearing, right. you know, a band tee. Yep. Yep. That's for sure. So that was quite the, quite the journey for me. The past six years has just been like working through that slowly and it's tough, you know, and seeing other people who are still in, in that world, like that's why I wanted to write this book is just to share, even if it helps like one person who has been harmed by this theology or someone who is in a damaging place where they're just so confused, um, to hopefully just have them to read my story and see, okay, I'm still working through some of those, those things, like in my mind, I'll come and I'll have these fears that are ungrounded and I'll have to go back to the word of God and say, what does God's word actually say? And so those things still come up from time to time, but realizing, um, that it's a beautiful thing to see God as sovereign overall. And I don't have to worry about, okay, I walked through that and now my life will be like this because I have went through all this stuff. No, you can, you can have a beautiful life that glorifies God and you can come to know the true love and peace of God as a child of God. Um, even if you haven't experienced that before in the setting that you're in, it's worth working through all of the difficulty, pain, all of the confusion, um, to know who Jesus truly is. Yeah. Yeah. What about your family? Have they read this book and are they, what is their reaction to, to your journey of really discovering who the God of the Bible is? Well, from the start, I had one in my family to know what I believe on many different areas of life. And so whenever I first started wearing pants, I talked to my parents about that and, um, I wanted them to know, okay, I'm not leaving Christianity um, I, even though outward stuff is so big in those settings, I wanted them to know that I am committed to loving God and walking in a way that pleases him. Now that might look differently than them because I now have landed at a different conclusion, um, based on scripture where I'm going to walk. And so I think that, um, in some of those settings, you can say, okay, well, we've talked about it and now I know they know what I believe and I'm not trying to change, you know, their minds if they're, they're set in that. Mm -hmm. Um, ultimately I think it's just a discussion I wanted to have on the front end to let my family know about this book. And, um, but then I'll let them tell their stories too, as to where they are and all of their theology. Still, I just want to, as a Christian, we'll glorify God best by, um, speaking truth, but then also speaking truth and love. And that's yeah. where, um, I understand how people can come to different conclusions on stuff and hopefully extending grace and kindness as God has extended to me. That's, that's the goal. Yeah. Now you compare your brother, Josh to Bill Gothard in your book. Um, cause Gothard was accused of predatory behavior how did being raised under Gothard's ideas of morality and sexuality contribute to Josh's own struggles? You know, that's, it's something that's so difficult to talk about really, because, um, yeah, I, I mean, just seeing now where my brother is today, my heart breaks. Yeah. It, it's just, it's so difficult. And so given that I see in that setting where you're so focused on the outward, 
I've seen so many families where there's destruction inside and um, it fuels that because whenever you're focused on merely the outward stuff, what you're supposed to say, where you're supposed to go, not go, it can produce so much of this outward. I'm okay. Yeah. And inside who knows what's happening. And so, and it also fuels a lot of that um, because there's such a focus on this purity culture of being like so pure, but then you're missing the element that will keep you pure, which is out of love for God. Like you said, you can, you can put up whatever face you want on the front, but it's, it all goes back to having a relationship with Jesus. That's where it all begins and ends. And so if that's not there, then you're just putting up a front for everyone to see until that's exposed as who you really are. And so I'm grateful for justice being served in this situation. I'm grateful for um, the Lord exposing that sin. My heart just breaks for the victims and their families and all they've walked through. Yeah. Um, and so that's about all I want to say on it. It's just so heartbreaking and yeah. it's, it's really tough to talk about. Yeah. Did living your life out on national television, did that almost exacerbate your 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 predisposition to being very performative or how did that sort of influence that i that's a great question i would say it's kind of like i i am prone to like want to be a people pleaser even to this day you know i can like oh man like what does this person think of me when i go into a conversation and 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 feel that tension as i think a lot of people do but um being in the public eye i knew that people had strong opinions about how I was supposed to live my life or what decisions I would make rooting for me to leave um, everything I had known and move away or whatever, which is what I talk about in the beginning of the book. Mm -hmm. All of that performance based stuff comes from um, one, just like being a people pleaser, the other being on TV. And then the third thing is the theology of always having to have a smile on your face, always having to give this perfect answer, always having to say the right things and realizing that the freedom I have found in Christ is that I don't have to perform. I, I'm not helping anybody when I'm not being ginger, when by the grace of God, he produces those graces in us of kindness, patience. The fruit of the spirit is a beautiful thing when it's worked out in the life of the believer as fruit of salvation, not the other way around, because that's just a work that you're trying to produce these good works and the flesh will get in your way and you will give into your flesh if you're not a true believer. And at the end of the day, it won't matter. So I think a lot of that performance-based mindset came from before I was a believer. And then it continues afterwards in the, in our flesh that still remains, we want to perform. And even to this day, like if you go to church, you can think, oh man, on the way, like I was so bummed by this or that. And and when you show up, you don't, you can naturally when we're around people, we won't have a smile on our face, but realizing I want to be the same person at home that I am everywhere else. And so I want my kids to see that. I want them to see that Um, Having a relationship with Jesus is not that I'm going to be this perfect person, but whenever I fail, that the grace of God is there to carry me through Mm -hmm. and hopefully just to um, exemplify that to my kids because no one's perfect. People will let you down. I will let my kids down and, um, but hopefully pointing them to the one who will never let them down. Mm -hmm. uh, That's where um, I, I want to point my kids And also that's who I want to be is before God, the same person in public as I am in private. Yeah, it's really good. So Ginger, what would you say to somebody who right now might be in the process of deconstructing or they have a lot of church hurt? What would you say to people who may be having doubts and struggling right now? Yeah, I'd say at that place, like I understand there's so much pain and hurt and it's very difficult it feels foggy often to like walk through um such levels of pain even beyond what i've walked through i'm sure there are stories of um layers right of things that people have walked through but to know that just because this person claimed to speak for god and didn't 
that Christianity can often be wrapped up in what your view of somebody who who claimed to be a Christian but wasn't did or said, and that's how you view God in the Bible mm-hmm. entirely. And you put everything on that and say, well, I'm just done. I'm just totally done with this religion. But realizing that people in the Christian world, people outside of the Christian world will fail you. We all know upon our hearts is written <laughs> how our longings and our desires are. We we long to have perfect relationships with others. We long to um, know God, but our sin and the depravity of man often clouds our view of who God really is. And so my heart for anybody in that place is to run to God, run to him alone and pour out your heart before him and say, I'm confused. I don't understand and go to the word of God and read it in its context. And, and my encouragement would be to go to a church that's teaching the word of God carefully. And that's, it's tough for people to sit under any kind of teacher after you've been so harmed by teacher, by a Bible teacher, but going to the word of God and reading it properly instead of just pulling a verse out here and there and like letting it say whatever you want, reading it in its context, it's so helpful because you start to see the beauty of who Jesus really is. And amidst all that pain and stuff you're working through, Jesus is our only hope. So we can turn to the world for answers. We can turn to wherever for answers, but it's never going to last. It's never going to satisfy only Jesus himself. Having a relationship with God through Jesus is our only hope. And so that would be my prayer. And that's the whole goal of writing this book is that others could know the joy that we can find in Jesus and setting aside those man-made rules, setting aside the world's perspectives and come to Jesus. What pastors do you like to read now? Hmm. One of my favorites right now is Alistair Begg. I'm just into Alistair. He's so great. He's so pastoral, gracious, and kind. Um, I was listening to a sermon from him the other day, and I it was on a lot of these topics um, that we're discussing today. And it was so helpful um, talking about, he would say, run away from teachers who claim to have some element of truth that you haven't heard anywhere else. They claim to have this answer to all, all of life's problems run away as fast as you can and as far as you can, because that will lead you nowhere good. So I I love his teaching. I love John Piper. His ministry has really blessed my heart, encouraged my heart. My own pastor, John MacArthur, has also been a huge blessing to me. So um, yeah, I would just say like finding a local church, this local church body has only supported me and encouraged me and helped me through these seasons, seasons of difficulty Um, but given me a greater view of who God truly is. 